he wants to jump. 1,000 cars. Sir, you have a 1,000 cars. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. Or we, we owe this horsepower to Uncle Sam. <laughs> Too many car. car. You know, roses would be... Uh... Like, I put my beer belly on it. Yeah. You can't immediately tell somebody how many cars you have. You'll really give those uppity yuppies something to think about. Stay on the bar. Don't go yeah. off the bar with your Bronco. 1980 Volvo horns. What's right? Me, me. Yeah. Only the man's coolant. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I thought it'd be small. It's for a small car. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's still an automatic transmission. They're never going to be light. It's definitely going to have to crash. Starting off with Brad buying another car. That's the West. <laughs> Internet. You know, is this a Nigerian oil print? Uh, I also wish you drove a tan Camry. Anyways, anyway, that, that's a horrible, very horrible podcast content. A very a inside joke. Welcome to Auto Off Topic. Hey, we've got uh, our regular Brad and our extra Brad tonight. Extra Brad reporting for duty. Two Brads, one Andrew, no waiting. That's right. So, uh, NASCAR, huh? It's the end of the season, last race? Yeah, it's over. Yeah, Phoenix was today. Um, I sat down to watch the race, and I was like, you know, I'm not very smart because <laughs> this racetrack is 30 minutes away from me, and I'm I was going to ask why you weren't there. <laughs> yeah, it just... Uh, we'll, we'll touch on later. I just got back from SEMA, so I'm a little... I can't say I'm jet lagged because it's the same time zone. Well, it's not the same time zone, but it was last week. It's not this week. That's also a confusing <laughs> topic. Last week, Las Vegas was same time zone as us. Uh, and so I'm a little tired and didn't think about it. And uh, Naomi actually asked me, she said, how much are tickets to an event like this? I was like, I don't know, 50 bucks, 100 bucks. And she looked it up. She's like, they start at $16. And I was like, yeah, I probably should. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, it's even closer than when you lived here to an HMS. It was like an hour and a half. Well, NHMS was also, yeah, an hour and a half to two hours, plus the traffic was always a nightmare. Uh, yeah. Where this track is, because it's outside Phoenix, there's plenty of roads in Tons of roads to it. I don't think traffic <laughs> would even be bad, so I probably should have gone. You know, it's A, it's the championship race. B, it's 30 minutes from my house. Like, it, it's it's like 37 miles away. Like, what am I? What a dummy. But so I'll, <laughs> I'll reconsider all this for next year, so... <laughs> maybe maybe next year, Andrew, you'll have to come out for the championship race. We'll have to do a, yeah. a thing here with the race together. So Are they always going to do it at Phoenix? They've done it the past three years in Phoenix. Oh. So it seems to be the... I don't I don't know how they chose Phoenix, other than the weather's always nice as late in the year. I think it's maybe. probably part of it. You know, it's not super probably hot. It has a lot Phoenix. to do with it. Yeah. It's not yeah. super hot here. Actually, it was 25 degrees colder here today than it is in... Massachusetts, just to uh, get the full, you wow. know, weather off topic podcast going. So yeah. you guys are currently in a heat wave uh, in what is it, it November sixth or something? And it was eighty degrees, and mm-hmm. it was like mm-hmm. this morning. It was like fifty five degrees here. I think I think it hit sixty. It's sixty something today, but it was not hot. What did that? Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was seventy five here in Cleveland, and that is not to be expected. Nope. Yeah, I just checked. We hit we hit seventy today. That was our high. So it's colder here than on the East wow. Coast. So, so I'm moving back. I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ask me again in January. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, for sure. But anyway, so I think that's why it's out here. But anyway, so yeah, it's the final race of the season. They do two races there every year. Phoenix is kind of a wild track because there's no out of bounds. So yeah, what's up with that? Every restart <laughs> just has like five, six cars wide into turn two, turn one and two. And I just don't. I mean, it's cool. It's unique to Phoenix. There's no curbs. There's no boundary lines. And I don't know who decided that, but at some point, somebody decided I, that. And it makes for an interesting restart every time. I love how they're like, uh, you know, the wall ride. That's You can't do that. You shouldn't be able to do that. But yet, this track has no rules other yeah, than the walls. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you couldn't do a wall it's ride at this track. That's how it used to be. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't do a wall ride at this track. They were talking about that, actually, because... Yeah. You know, Ross Chastain saw himself in the same kind of situation he was last week where he needed to make up, you know, a couple of seconds with a lap to go. But the way the walls are designed here, the the straightaway going into turn three and four actually kind of juts to the right a little bit. So if he had done that, it would have guaranteed he crashed. 
So would have been would hilarious be. if he did it and won the championship that way. Yeah, it would have been hilarious, <laughs> yes. However, the the NASCAR conspiracy theorists would never have let that one slide. They would have been like, no. hey, guys, what's happening here? So, but uh, spoiler alert. That would be you, almost as controversial as the F1 championship last year. Yeah, which I don't know anything about, as we've <laughs> established already on this podcast, that we don't know what happens there. <laughs> Uh, also, I'm super annoyed at F1 because they did a big thing in Las Vegas today or yesterday, yesterday, one day oh. after all the car people left where they ran F1 cars up and down the strip. And I was like, why would mm-hmm. you do that the day after SEMA when all the people who care about it are gone? Like, I would, I don't really like F1, but I'd love to have seen the F1 yeah. cars rip up and down the strip. That would have been awesome. There are, there are car events the week of the weekend after SEMA throughout Vegas. Oh really? So like the Vegas Las Vegas Concours was on Sunday. That was before like Vegas. Other... That was that was the week before SEMA, the Concours. It was? Yep. I'm pretty sure it was the week after because we got invited. The week after is right now. Today is the week after. Right. It was yeah. last weekend. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It, de- it definitely was. I already saw articles about it last week. <laughs> so I know it already happened. Mm. Okay. All right. I'm wrong. And- and Sorry. we discussed we discussed how if we'd known that earlier we would have gone to that instead at Championship NASCAR. So yeah. spoiler alert if you haven't watched it, I don't know, mute us for the next minute or two if you haven't already anyway. Um Joey Logano won the championship second yep. time he's won it. He won it in twenty eighteen. I'm not mad about it. The weird thing about NASCAR now is that the way the point system works at the final race, there is only four cars that can even win the championship like any sports i guess any sports comes down to the last game so this much like any other sport comes down to the last race you get the four teams that can win the race one of them was obviously joey logano joey logano won the race the cool fact about that is he's the first driver to have won a championship twice in a ford since david pearson in 1968 yeah, it's weird, right? It's weird. Oh, Ford's wow. been there the whole time. How did nobody ever do a two-time win with Ford before? I don't, I don't understand. But and it was, it was a cool end <laughs> of the season. Um, there was definitely some last couple of laps. There were a couple of drivers who still could have taken it, and it wound up going to Logano. So it wasn't boring. It was a good race, and uh, I'm a little bummed that uh, our boy Chase Elliott didn't do it. But you know, it is what it is. He had a racing incident with Chastain earlier, and I don't think either of them are to blame. After watching the replay a few times, it seems like it was just they both went for the same spot at the same time. And I think if anything, Elliot has a little more blame himself because he came down on top of cars below him. So I don't know. But anyway, so Joey Logano won the championship. It's a good race. Uh, if you haven't watched it, I'd say still maybe watch it on Fast Forward if you're a NASCAR fan. Kind of skip to some of the highlights. That was a pretty clean race. Not a lot of yellows. Um but it was a uh, it was a good finish, and again, I'm not upset. Yeah, Ligano and won. Ligano won. I don't hate him. So. End of stage two, there are a bunch of cars that might have run out of gas because they didn't have enough cautions. Yep. Yeah, the cars were like a lot of guys were coasting. Yep. That's a, um, yeah, it was a good race. Yeah, I'm Go team track house. I was a little. Yeah, I mean, maybe. we were hoping, hoping for Chastain. <laughs> maybe he could finish, cut. but <laughs> it didn't happen. I listen. Uh, Trackhouse, the team, the drivers, Chastain, they were nobody's last year. So yeah. they finished second in the championship this year. And, I mean, that's a hell of an entry into the big show, you know. I mean, that, I don't think he was a rookie driver, but he's fairly new. And uh, to be second place is nobody would have put him there. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, I don't know season. if you heard it. The announcers had some sort of factoid. He was driving like he would drive a motorhome for people to the track and then race yeah, just, just to get involved with Whoa. racing. He drove the motor coach yeah. like five years ago or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or five or six oh, years that's ago. Cool. And his spotter did yeah. too. That's how they know each other. They're both motor coach drivers for NASCAR drivers. So <laughs> yeah, cool. But anyway, moving on from NASCAR, uh, what else we got to talk about today, Andrew, before we get into Brad's uh, story of. Well, yeah, cause there's some related Vegas stuff we can talk about. So the, but uh, we've been talking about my Volkswagen, the new car that's not supposed to have any problems for a long time. Uh-huh. And I just do regular maintenance too. And I drive it every day and don't touch it. And, uh, you know, just leaves time for me to work on my other cars. Well, it had a 
cylinder three misfire code. And then finally I went back again to the dealer and they're like, well, it needs a carbon blast. I'm like, really at 30 K like, yeah. I'm like, okay. They're like that's not under warranty. I'm like, okay, great. And he's like, the service writer's like, normally it's like 1500. I'm like, he's like, but we'll do it for 700. It seems I'm to like, me like seven to 800 is the price I hear that it normally is. So it sounds like the service writer is giving you one of those lines where they want to make you feel good about spending seven hundred dollars <laughs> and make you feel like it's a discount because I've heard that it's seven to eight hundred dollars to have it done. So I called the local independent that's down the street that I like to have do the maintenance, and they said it was around the same price. Oh, well, okay, maybe it's gone up in but, the past few years. But so. they were also like thirty k seems of really early. Have gone up. Yeah, there's there's definitely two camps here. They're like. No, you only need to do this car at 60K. And there's other people that are like, no, 30K is, is not that unusual at all for them to be carboned up. And I'm like, that's really weird because I also changed the oil 5,000 miles earlier than the interval says so that you don't get oil filled with carbon that's blowing by into the intake. But maybe that's the problem. I don't know. I, maybe I do oil, a lot of idling in traffic. Maybe the and, oil gets more magnetic to the carbon as it gets more carbon in it. It's like a rolling snowball and you take it out of there. It's harder to catch it. That's a wild, know. a wild statement that I have no <laughs> fact behind. <laughs> and maybe, I mean, it was doing it a little bit before I drove cross country and then maybe, you know, 12 hours at a time at a constant RPM was not great. I don't know. Who knows? It, it I don't sounds, know. I don't it, understand. It's, it's really weird. I mean, this, this feels like a thing that shouldn't happen. No, like, like, and if it that was a problem ten years ago, it yeah. shouldn't be a problem now. But and if if it had a check engine light on when I needed to go get an inspection sticker here in the state of Massachusetts, it would fail for emissions. Right. Mm-hmm. So to tell me that it's not covered under emissions is really frustrating. That's not under warranty. Yeah, that should. That, I would think it would still be covered, especially with the mileage on it. But hey, what do I know? I don't write the rules. And then. To, well, that's the other thing, because from working in dealerships, I know that their internal cost for that service was not $700. So they didn't actually split it evenly with me. Right. I paid the customer price, half of the customer price, and they paid whatever their internal price is, probably 200 bucks. Sure. Uh, and then to add insult to injury, I get the car back, and I'm looking at it, and the front bumper has a huge scratch on it. And it's, the not place, and the, and the, <laughs> it's not a scratch. They smashed something into your car. Or it's clearly or no. It's clearly the that you can see where the two legs from the cart that maybe the walnut machine was on okay. was pushed in the front bumper. Okay, it's not from another it's, vehicle. Yeah. Okay, the pictures look def- like a smashed I, bumper. No, I, it, a car didn't. And when I called them back, they think it's like I'm complaining that a car hit it. I'm like, no, it's definitely the. If we went out to the shop and got the cart that the t- the tech was using it would probably line up exactly with the marks in the bumper. Like he was just being careless and like leaned the cart into the car, which I don't understand either. Cause if you're doing the service all the time, you should know that or like put foam on the legs or something. Yeah. So what do they say about fixing it? I have to hear back from the service writer on Monday. Cause the, also the service manager, I want to talk to the service manager. Like I need to talk to the manager. This of course this was Saturday. Um, was uh on is on vacation this week this coming week so oh good so i'm not super happy with them and We're i don't know i don't even really want yet. them <laughs> no it's kelly volkswagen oh, okay we got her name okay. it's terrible <laughs> yeah i uh, actually i actually never used them even when i lived there with my volkswagen i went to a different volkswagen dealer so i well they were pretty they're pretty new as a volkswagen dealer they took over for beverly volkswagen north shore volkswagen which was yeah. also pretty shady um, yeah, well, they're, they're they're building burned down under mysterious circumstances. So. Yeah. Uh, so n- needless to say, I'm not very happy with that, and I, I don't even. I could probably buff it out; it'd probably be all right. But I don't want them to like paint or anything because I just feel like it's going to be worse. Like it'll it somehow look, be worse. It didn't look like it'd be buffed out. Uh, I, after I washed the car, it's not as bad. It's right. the plastic underneath; the silver piece is gouged. The paint is scratched. The, the lighting in the pictures you sent me made the thing look like it got driven into by another car. So no, it looked really it's definitely bad. a cart. Okay. If I, I'll take another one where you can see both and you can see how they line up vertically. Even. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, hopefully they take care of it. And if they if they do want to fix it and it does require paint, uh, do not use their dealership. Have no put put nope. an insurance claim in and put it back towards them. Is how I would do it at that point. Because then you could use a body shop that we trust and not Kelly's Body Shop, which I don't trust. No, so. because they'll just paint it with the bumper on it, and it'll be all orange peely, and it'll be over spraying my headlights or something probably, stupid. They'll, they'll probably take the bumper off. Um, it actually is and, easier for them to take the bumper off to fix it than it is to do it on the car, but. I, I wouldn't use their body shop. They'll find a way not to. Way. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's um, it's I'm that's annoyed for you. <laughs> it's just annoyed because I think we'll get to your stuff, but it's a, you had a similar thing with another shop. Just trying to get shops to do stuff. I'm not even asking for discounted prices. Right. I'll pay you yeah. the full price that you want, but just please do exactly what I asked you to do. Yeah, and do it carefully. Yeah. 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 This is why I went to the shops I go to because I trust them at that point. Yeah, so. I'm not not looking for the buddy price. I want I'm walking in, I'm paying you for the full price. Yeah. This is like what happened redoing my kitchen. All the work I did is fine. The thing I paid for, the tile floor, is warped and like moving. Mm. <laughs> it's like ah it's so annoying. Project cars, house project issues. Houses. I mean getting a Getting a contractor to do anything on a house these days is just impossible. Yeah. It's I don't know what it is, but I know it's and it's I'm not I don't even I don't ask people for discounts. I don't haggle with the price either. I'll shop mm-hmm. around and I'll get mm-hmm. estimates, but I'll and I'll agree with you on a price, and then I'll pay you. <laughs> I have money. I'll pay you. That's yeah. the exchange. Yes. So anyway, twenty dollars can buy many peanuts. Yeah. Um, Apparently it's seven hundred dollars is the cost right now for walnuts. So I don't want to. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Should have told them I have a nut allergy and yeah. <laughs> can't do that to the car. I, uh, you know, you say that as a joke, Andrew, but you know there's somebody who's gone in there and has heard that it's a walnut blast. And we're like, you can't put walnuts in my car. They come through my vents, and then my child will get sick. So you know it's. Happening. I mean, the engine bay was pretty dirty. I cleaned it too. After they finished but that it? could have been from driving across oh, okay. country. It was dusty. All right. We'll, we'll let that one slide. But. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. So I had them change the oil the last time it was there. They washed it. I picked it up the other day after spending $700. They hadn't even washed it. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's better than that. Was the, that was the discount that they cut you. Was yeah. They, they yeah. took the $700 car wash off. Well, you remember my Volkswagen <laughs> issues about a year and a half ago, two years ago, when I get it back with like t- beige interior covered in black grease every time. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's the same no matter where you are. They're all terrible. Well, that's the thing. I show up with a clean, nice car. You think I'm not going to notice? Well, it's not like I showed up this car with like filled with trash and dings all over it. Volkswagen makes an excellent product, but their dealer network is uh, lacking for sure. This is every car dealership. Yeah. This is why I don't work in them anymore. Yeah, you're probably but right. Anyway, the uh, Brad, you did some, well, Brad DeSantis. <laughs> you went to uh, SEMA. So how was I that? I did. So for anybody who's never been to SEMA, uh, Brad, I think you've probably been before. I've been, I think, five times. Okay. Yeah. Andrew, I know you yeah. have not been yet. Um, I know that I have not. from the outside, SEMA seems like this, like, holy grail of events that you have to, you know, do your bidding to get into, and it's really hard to be there, and you have to be an industry professional, and this whole thing. Um, I can tell you that I've now that I've been there, you just need to be a human. Uh, actually, Pretty no, because there were also dogs there, so you don't need to be a human. You're a human <laughs> or a dog, and you're allowed in. And some of the trashiest people I've ever seen at a car event uh, attend the SEMA event. And I don't know how they get in there. I don't know how. I don't know what their professional setting is or how they're, quote, unquote, in industry. But uh, one particular individual was quite annoying to me, and he was walking around wearing pajama pants and a Peanuts Christmas shirt. So I just... <laughs> I, you know, I'm not Every, trying to be judgmental. He's but probably a millionaire. No, absolutely not. Probably, probably no, probably. definitely not. I can guarantee he's. Not. It's literally if you know somebody who has a car dealership or a body shop or yep. ha, or I mean, you guys have a podcast. You guys could be there as media, hundred percent. Yep. You don't even have to pay. You would get in for free. I've learned this now. Yes. So the fact yeah. that we've never been is insane. 
Um, again, it's always presented as you need to have this, you know, panache to get in there, but you really don't. I will say if you're going to go, it does pay to be media because you do get in obviously for free, which is nice. Not that it's expensive. It's like a $50 ticket for the week, but you do, you do mm-hmm. get in for free. Um, and also you get to get in a half hour to an hour earlier than the general public. Yes. So you do have that yep. time in the morning where there's nobody around in order to shoot for photos. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what the numbers were as far as people this year. I know the last big SEMA year, obviously pre pandemic in 2019, there were 160,000 attendees. Um, and of those I was hun- there. It was bonkers. I bet. And of those 160,000, yeah. only 3,000 were media. So you do have a significant uh, smaller mm-hmm. presence in the morning during the media times. Um, they also yep. feed the media breakfast on the first day. We had, uh, it was kind of interesting. We actually, we, I, I'm going to say it like it's fancy, but it's not fancy because I was, you know, still 100 feet away. But we had breakfast with Ken Block and Brian Scotto while watching the latest Jim Connor video which mm. was kind of cool. But again, it's not like we were like sitting at a table with them. It was, you know, me and 3000 of my closest friends hanging out in a room with pastries that I can't even eat. So it was fine, <laughs> but it was still, I had it was dinner still a with him opening. once. Oh, did you? Interesting. Yeah. I was a, I was an intern for rally America. Um, okay. When they like at the height of the Subaru days, this was right. 2012, six or oh, seven. Yeah, really or, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. The I was in college, so uh, maybe it was, maybe it was like oh eight oh nine because I think I was either a junior or a senior. Yeah, regardless. But anyway, um, it was at uh, LSPR in Northern Michigan, yep. middle of friggin' nowhere. Yep. And uh, it was the post awards banquet or whatever. So uh, he and Alex Gelsomino and Travis and. I think Chrissy Beavis was co-driver then. Yeah. Um, they they all uh, sat at the same table the, as the staff, so right. I was there. It was kind of cool. Actually, nice guys. Yeah, I've always heard that. Uh, so this yeah, that's how they that's how they opened times at rallies. That's how they opened the event, which was kind of cool and it was neat to kind of so you watched it with him and Brian Scotto, and then there was a little Q and A with uh, I think it's the guy who announces the FD events, the drifting events. I don't remember his name, but I think that's who the, mm. the guy was. Um, just kind of like a little Q and A with them in there to, to kick off, you know, SEMA week, which was kind of neat. Um, and then you get into the halls and you're on your own, just kind of figuring out what's what, and where's where, and you know how to find things. And they do have an app that you can put in your phone that shows you where things are, which is kind of neat. It worked fairly well. Um, obviously, most things are stagnant displays. There is an autocross course out back where they're doing an active. Uh, Optima Batteries Fastest Streetcar Challenge, which is you know mostly old muscle cars converted into autocross cars. In that same area, they did a little demonstration with some of like, I think they were the Rockstar Energy drivers and drifters, and they had some guys drifting, and there were quads jumping over them when they're drifting, and some of that stuff was out back. Um, the, the amount of... The sheer amount of lifted pickup trucks is what I think blew my mind more than anything else. I, I don't understand them. I don't know that I ever will. They're certainly not my style or any of your style or likely any of our listeners' style because they're all the over-the-top, full-chromed, undercarriage, powder-coated pink and purple and blue and green, just ridiculous train horns and 12-inch exhaust tips. So I don't... I don't get that whole scene. Uh, there's lots of hot rods and muscle cars, and there are a lot of cars that get unveiled. And this is another thing I don't understand. If you are a manufacturer and you're bringing out a brand new car and you want to do an unveiling where you roll the car out under a cover and you say, at 12 noon today, we're going to unveil the new XYZ supercar, that's cool. If you are just a dude who's on YouTube and build a new drift car, why do you deserve to have an unveiling of your drift car? And why do people care? I don't understand I mean, that. I, w- I will say this. I have been diligently watching the um, Stanceworks build of the Honda-powered Ferrari. Yes. 
I've been watching it every week. Okay. He did the final unveil of the car at SEMA. Sure. A lot of effort and a lot of work has gone into that. And it was, you know, it's a big story and whatever. Every one of those has a following. It may not be us. Okay. But it's kind of along the same lines. So maybe there's somebody, you know, maybe there's, I don't know. So I didn't know he did a big unveil. Cletus or whatever. I don't. I'll tell you exactly who it was in a second. I know okay. that Mike Burrow's car was there. Uh, actually, mm-hmm. I met Mike Burrow's super nice guy. Very I nice guy. Didn't what I didn't know was he did a cover off display. But that being said, he built a hell of a car. He stripped that mm-hmm. thing down to as bare as you can and rebuilt it from the ground up. He re-engineered the car into a brand new car. He has had a huge following that's been watching him build this car. The one that really confused me was a YouTuber by the name of TJ Hunt. Mm-hmm. I don't know much about him. I know that he, I think, came from money. and He's got a huge following. But like so millions. Toyota, or Subaru, excuse me, Subaru and Nissan gave him two brand new cars. Mm-hmm. And all he did was lower them and put a body kit on them. And then he had a huge reveal that hundreds of people stood around watching. And sure. I don't understand what the appeal of that is because it's literally a fiberglass body kit on a brand new car. And it's not even like, you know well, how, here's the other thing. You though. know how just a few minutes ago you said that you didn't know how crazy it was that like anyone and their brother could be at the show. Yeah. Anyone, and their brother can build a build. Sure. There's no like, there's no, there's nothing at SEMA that stops them from doing an unveiling or, you know, it's just, it's their booth. They can do whatever they want. It wasn't, it, it wasn't so his like, booth. Yeah. It was at Magnaflow's booth. He didn't okay, have his own well, booth. whatever. So I guess at that sure. point it's follow the money, right? It's, so I, yeah, I don't know. Exactly. I just, it was weird to me because not only did he just build these two cars that he, I guess, owns the company that makes the body kit, but they were mm. other cars in SEMA that had the same body kit that had just been on display all week. So it wasn't like he was debuting the first of this time anybody sees his body kit that you can now buy. Like there was literally one parked out front outside the doors that people without passes could see. Like on the main drag out front. So that was was weird to me. Magnaflow Magnaflow wants the attention of his YouTube channel. 100%. He live streams the thing on his YouTube channel. Magnaflow's in the background. That's why. And so it's a hundred percent. Just follow let, whoever is doing it. And let me rephrase. Exactly let me rephrase my statement. Then <laughs> I understand why they do it because money is green and we all like money. What I don't understand is why everybody cares. <laughs> That's what I don't understand. And maybe oh, it's because I'm not the audience. Totally. I mean, why do millions of people watch Doug Demiro videos every week? I I, I, I like Doug. He's a nice and, guy. Yeah. I can't watch his videos. Sure. I just can't. Mm-hmm. And to, to that note. And, and totally, like, more power to you. If you like him, that's your thing. I'm fine with that. I'm not knocking you. It's not my thing. Yeah. I don't watch it. I don't I, watch I CJ guess. Hunt videos. I don't watch yeah. Cletus McFarlane videos. I You know, there's all kinds you. of pockets of car culture that, you know. There's 50s of... 50s of people that listen to Auto Off Topic. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and who knows why? But Dozens you know every week. We've never done an unveiling or made them wait for something. Actually, that's not true. We make them wait for everything that we say we're going to do, and we never do. So, I guess we do make them wait for things. <laughs> Just string them along. Just string them along. Exactly. So, anyway, Just a Ponzi speaking of a of a podcast. Maybe ultimately, it's not for me, and that's what it is. It just it seemed confusing to me that it wasn't anything special. It was these body kits that had already been on display on other cars around the hall all week. I don't know why I had to wait till Tuesday to see his because his was blue versus the green one up front or the gray one next to that. Like it just, it seemed odd to me. And I guess you're probably correct. It's follow the money. You know, he generates the clicks. 50 million followers is probably lots of clickbait bunny. Mm-hmm. You know, I also did not, don't understand why other YouTubers that aren't even car people like uh, that. Who's the super douchebag boxer guy. Now, Jake Paul was Jake Paul, or Logan Paul. I don't know. Whichever one is the crazier one was walking around SEMA with an entourage the entire time and people just following, trying to get pictures next to him. And I'm like, he's just this, 
I don't know. I don't get it. Celebrity culture never meant much to me, I guess, is what it is. But Totally. That, that being said, you. I did have two... I, I've never had, like, a fan fanboy moment where I kind of like, yeah. you know, like, oh, my God, here you go. Uh, I did get to the top of the broken escalator that I had to walk up the stairs, and it was a good, solid <laughs> flight of stairs. Escalators can never be broken. They just become (laughs) stairs. Escalator temporarily (laughs) stairs. Sorry for the convenience. (laughs) R.I.P. Mitch Hedberg. Um, I got to the top of the escalator that was temporarily broken and sitting on a bench, winded, obviously, from climbing the same set of stairs that I just did, was none other than five feet in front of me, Richard Petty. Oh, and nice! I oh, have never, cool. yeah, I've never like fanboyed more. And he has whole like people around him trying to like give him water and like because he's a like, hundred years old. Was now. it? Yeah, he's old. He's, yeah. Was it really Richard Petty or was it an old guy in a hat? No, this was because that's pretty much all Richard Petty is. This days. was a hundred percent Richard Petty. He was just sitting there in his chair <laughs> trying to like catch his breath. I think after climbing these stairs, so I didn't. I, cool. I, I, I was like one of those moments. Like I want to say hi to this man. I want to say hi, and I couldn't do it. And. I feel like a jerk afterwards, but I would have felt like more of a jerk. Like, my king, my king. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I did have a fan, you know, a fanboy moment that I've never actually had in real life. So that was that was neat. Uh, I also I met Gene Winfield. It was kind of cool. He's also a hundred years old now. So, but anyway, it was it was a hell of an experience. There's a lot of really nice cars there. There's a lot of cars that you know that are very popular to the same crowd that wanted to see TJ Hunt's cars, YouTube builds that in person are real bad, mm-hmm. real bad. Like you see them on TV and I know of their existence, even though I don't watch their YouTube videos. And it's like, wow, that's quite the fabricating skill on that car. And then you go see the car in person and you're like, that guy should never touch a welder or Bondo ever <laughs> again, because those cars are really bad. Uh, I, I don't think I'll call them up by name, but you can figure out if you know who I'm talking about, who built a mid engine Mustang this year. And it was, Mm. it was very bad. (laughs) The fit and finish was atrocious. You know, the trunk lid had a three quarter inch gap at the top and it touched the quarter panel at the bottom and just stuff like that, you know, sanding marks. And you could see where the metal and the, the fiberglass flares meet the, steel actual body of the mustang and it's not like on purpose it's supposed to i don't know it's it's not the quality of car you expect to see at a high level car show unveiled the same way in the holly performance (laughs) booth you know you don't expect a car that looks like it was built by an amateur at that point like listen it's more than i've ever built of course i'm not saying that but i think if i put any effort into it, I wouldn't have shown it in the same condition it was shown. We'll put it that way. So it was mm-hmm. definitely a sketchy thing. And I can, we could talk about some more of that off air guys, but there were some, some <laughs> of those cars that are really bad. And of course you have the cars you've never seen in real life that you have only seen in magazines, like a ring brothers build that is on real level. Like I don't particularly like their style, mm-hmm. but there is no getting mm-hmm. past you know, the, the, the cleanliness and the sanitariness of their builds and the amount of effort and time. Ring get. Brothers reminds me of, like, uh, Rad Rides by Troy. It's like the same they're, they're totally, style, yeah. Yeah, they're totally not my style, but they're you can tell, like, the details went into that thing. Oh, for sure. They had, like, five cars there, and they were all pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, and actually, I'd never seen a Kindig car in person either, and Kindig cars also are not my style, but they're also very well put together. They're, they're super I'm, clean I'm blanking cars. right now. Who does the derelicts? So um, that's Icon. Icon. Did you yeah. see, were any of those there? Uh, there were no Icons there. I've seen Icons before, but yeah. there were none that were there. There's a Icon, there's one of the electric ones local that's been yeah. to a couple of our events out here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, the Mercury, 50 Mercury electric power. Oh, Mercury. I saw that one in the Optima Batteries booth. At okay. SEMA a few years so, ago. I, I don't know if the car is permanently in Scottsdale, but it's been at events at Scottsdale in the past. Mm. So I've, I've seen That's that cool. one. In, I've seen that one in person, and I've seen some of his FJ builds in person yeah, before. And actually, those Bronco, are amazing, right? There's a Bronco in Scottsdale as well. It's an Icon Bronco. So and they, yeah, they're very well put together. And that's what I'm saying. It's like not these guys that I guess that's the difference between a YouTuber and a guy who's got a show on the Motor Trend Network, maybe. And I guess I can't say that either because not every show at Motor Trend makes good cars either. But 
<laughs> some of these cars that are picked up by the cable TV channels, they have a much more money and time behind them where YouTube is literally, I could build a car and put it on YouTube and I probably should because yeah. I do work on cars all goddamn week and don't put anything on the internet and should make money with it. But anyway, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, they can do it and whatever they want. And all they do is get their following and people that haven't seen their car in person have only seen their car being built online and you can hide a lot of sins online. So it's, it's a little eye opening to see some of the stuff and be like, I, I could just do this. Like we, we, Andrew, we could make videos and make a lot of money and we just need to say, smash that like button a couple of times. And next thing you know, we're millionaires. <laughs> it's all that's quite it's the it. hustle though. It's all, that's it. it's all it takes. Listen, I'm willing to do the hustle for millions of dollars. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was yeah. definitely an eye open experience. It was a side of car culture I've not seen before, which is hard to say sometimes. Being as you know, I think the three of us, without trying to be braggadocious, are all probably pretty jaded when it comes to car culture, because we've you know we've been to a lot of things. You know, we've mm-hmm. we've all traveled the country and seen every event that there is to see. We've been to Concours. We've been to Radwoods. We've been to every museum that we can think of. We've been to racing events. We've been to different high-end shops and seeing all of it kind of in one place is certainly eye-opening for a, for a first-timer's experience. I'm sure after five or six times go to see me, you're like, cool. Like, I don't care. Totally. It is what it is. Totally. I mean, I, I, tr- I never try to get that jaded. Like, I, I always try to find the fun in it. But certainly after the second time, it's work. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's kind of a slog. You've got to just, you know, you're walking miles every day, and it's... There know, was one day I logged butt. 13 miles on my my yeah. my watch. Yeah, that's it's <laughs> a lot of walking. <laughs> yeah, 26 It's a big, I mean, SEMA's huge. It's one, you know, four I, halls. I, I looked at the fact there are five halls now. Oh, they okay. have a fifth hall this year. Uh, it's 1.2 million square foot of indoor display space. And another yeah. one million square feet outside. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. So it's a lot of area to cover. And it takes up multiple city blocks in Vegas, the convention center does. It was actually yeah. kind of neat because having gone to Radwood in Vegas, I immediately recognized the parking lot where the Hoonigan area mm-hmm. was doing their thing as the parking lot that the Radwood event was in under the, the mm. monorail. So that's kind of cool. But yep. that's another, another thing. I had never seen a live Hoonigan event before. Uh, I've been to the Hoonigan Garage a few times. I met a bunch of the guys before, but I've never seen a actual, you know, burn yard event. I think that's what they call it. And mm-hmm. the amount of destruction that they convince people to do to their personal cars is uh-huh. absurd. <laughs> for for YouTube fame. And for and nothing. 30 seconds of YouTube fame. Yeah, for mm-hmm. nothing. They, they closed. Yeah. So we went to the last show on Thursday night, which they billed as like, this is going to be our, you know, there is one more show tomorrow, but this is really the show. And they ended Burn it. it. Down. They ended the show with five guys in the burnout pit, which is not a very big burnout pit, swinging their trucks around doing donuts, five Silverados, oh. all huge dollar builds with really nice paint jobs. And one of them had like 28 inch wheels and it was all tucked up inside. So, you know, there's more body work inside. And they just all ran them until they caught on fire or quarter panels blew off and tires blew off and wheels blew apart. Mm. And I was like, I just watched $150,000 in destruction in 30 seconds. And for what? Yep. Yep. It didn't make any sense. So I guess. It does for the views. (laughs) But the views go to Hoonigan. They don't even go to the guy who's built the car. I know. 100% 100% That's crazy, thing. right? Hoonigan's making money off of these blue collar guys destroying their cars in their parking lot. And that is insane to me. Listen, I'm here for it. I watched it. It was fun. No question. I probably got some kind of disease from all the tire smoke I inhaled, but <laughs> hey, life goes on, right? I uh, can't, I, like, working at that shop has to be like, they're all going to get black lung or something just yeah. from the amount of, the amount of tires donuts and stuff that they do. Yeah. 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 Ab- absolutely insane. But it was, it was a hell of a show. We'll put it that way. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a good time. I, I would like to do it again. I'd like to do it when I'm not on the clock because I was hustling all week doing work. So that took a yeah. little bit of the fun out of it. And uh, you know, you're in Vegas. There's a lot of good restaurants you want to try and stuff, but 
after your whole work day, you don't want to go out. You just want to go to your hotel room. And I still had like actual other work to do too. So it, was, it definitely took away from Oof, some of the fun yeah. of it. I don't like Vegas in general, but I know there's good food there. So I'd like to eat some of the good food. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to eat one night with some other friends that were in town. We got you know a Brazilian steakhouse where they shave all the steak in your plate until you tell them to stop because you're going to explode. So mm -hmm. that was that was a good time. But yeah, overall, it's uh, it's an experience, and I've needed this entire weekend to recover from it. I'll put it that way. So it's definitely it definitely definitely beat me up pretty good. So enjoyable, but tiring. So I uh, I'd encourage you to go if you can go. It's not as hard as you think. <laughs> it's not special. No, Any, almost anybody can no, go. No, it's not. Almost anybody can go. Put. Find, find a way to get a blog published somewhere, even self-publish <laughs> it, and put down a couple of YouTube videos, and you punched yourself a media ticket to SEMA. So, mm -hmm. that's about it. So, speaking of um, Vegas, I don't think we, because we didn't record last week, we didn't talk about, uh, is it was it called Electricana? Yes. Is that what they call yes. it? Electricana. Yeah, yeah, Electricana. The new Jim Connor video? Yep. Which was it in Vegas. It had its moments. It had its moments. Cool. It was pretty cool. Uh, I don't know what what hotel he was doing the donuts in the foyer of, but that was pretty intense. It was yeah. a very small space, a lot of glass doors on the carpet, and uh, it looked, looked pretty mm -hmm. good. Uh, the highlight of mm -hmm. that whole video to me, though, was all of the vintage Audis parked around. So yeah, I was a, I, I was I was taken aback that they didn't use any of them. Like, none of them did anything. They just yeah, sat yeah. I feel like none of them have been driven in anger in a very long time, and they were probably afraid. No, of that's true, but, like, doing that. it's Audi. Yeah. Yeah. And it, like, they spent multiple millions of dollars on this video. They yeah, could have got cool. them running again. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't the, know. Um, but it's cool to see them just sitting there, especially the Hans Stuttgart. Like, I was really hoping it was still going to be in Vegas on display at SEMA, and, mm. or, the, or the Electricana car was. The only Audi that was there was Ken Block's personal um, mm. Sport Quattro, which is like, like super cool, obviously. But it's like the only thing I would have done differently is if they had lined up the electric car next to one of the vintage cars and just done like a drag race yeah, to like kick off oh, the video or something. That'd be cool. Yep. Just just to show the acceleration power of the electric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be. Cool. Um, the the backwards entry that yes. he did that was like the coolest shot that they've yep. done in any. That yep. was so cool, the, and the speed which with that thing does donuts is insane. Yeah, and that's one yeah. of the things that he was talking about in like the little breakfast speech he did. He was talking about how fast the donuts were. He was saying that in the gas cars, you know, the wheel speed the 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 donut is done at like sixty miles an hour, and it was done at like ninety in the electric car. <laughs> like it was disorientating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see it shows the speedometer on the yeah. dash, and it's it, there were points where it was over a hundred. Was that was that like, high? The wheels are turned. Yeah, I yeah. mean they were just like burning. Yeah, yeah, the wheel it's, speed was much higher great. in that car. So it, it's definitely. And I like, like the way, I like the way hot like hot it up electric cars sound because mm -hmm. they just sound like crazy RC cars. Yep, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm into it. They're definitely fun, yeah. um, for sure. So, th so that video was really cool, and then kind of quietly, Red Bull released a video of Scott Speed running the Dragon in a yeah in a um the the, the uh, rally cross car rally I think it was a rally cross build Subaru, of the yeah. Subaru. Yeah, that was, was also, really cool. Yeah, which is a, a Vermont sports car car. Um, that was awesome. And they did – and it it was funny because it's uh, – you don't really see it in the video, but when you – I went on, on Facebook when it came out, and I followed Killboy.com, which is one of the photographers for the Tale of the Dragon. Um, they kind of worked with Red Bull. They helped put it together, which was really cool. Mm. And they chose – they either did it last winter or – it must have been last winter because it's like the trees going, are mostly going without into leaves. The winter, yeah, it was very late fall. Last year, yep. Yes, so it it was really cool to see it that way because, and they probably wanted to do it because you got more light because there's no leaves in the trees. Plus, all the leaves blowing around the car looked really cool. Mm -hmm. And two, or three, whatever, wherever I am, the uh, I'm two beers deep. The uh, the uh, drone work. The video yeah. drone work is amazing now. It was really good. That 
the guys that are doing this chase drone work, oh my god, it's so good. Yeah, they're every bit these as talented camera as Scott angles. Speed. Yeah. <laughs> these are camera <laughs> angles you couldn't have imagined five years ago. Yep. Yeah. Of of, of cha- like coming up to the car, chasing the back of the car, then moving up and over the car. Like it's that is only stuff that they would have had to done in CGI in like a multi million dollar blockbuster. Yeah. Right? Like that's or uh, or maybe like 20 further feet away with a helicopter or something. Yeah. Yeah. Even then you wouldn't do like the flip upside down over the car. Like it wouldn't work. Right. Yeah. Right. So cool. Good stuff. Like I, I don't know, like I enjoy the car cause I'm into cars, but I'm also kind of a nerd about how films are made and how, and watching especially the way documentaries are made and, and camera work. So just seeing that, like I appreciate it. So, all right. Well, we've spent, there's a full minutes. in car. We spent yeah. 45 minutes that's talking okay. about stuff that's not Bradley related. And we got Bradley here patiently <laughs> chomping at the bit. We, hey, we, I'm, I'm just things. the third uh, co-host this week. That's all good. All right, yeah. Excellent. It's all good. Well, we'll get into what uh, Bragg did, um, Brad's been up to. So you were on, we talked about it back in February? In February. And since February. Yeah, go ahead. What, do you, what have you been up to? I, I have, uh, I got a new job. Um, bought a new house, bought four car, three cars and a motorcycle, uh, sold a car. You know about that one because it, it went to Brad. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, the Brads are very similar here. We, uh, yeah. We both bought four um, new vehicles this year. Yeah. And, and sold one. Mine are probably just as broken. Um, mine all run. Yeah. Anyway, mine all run. Mine all run. They all have something wrong with them, but they all run. Yeah, they're old cars. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. Is your live your live wire broken? Yeah, I don't think so. No, no, the live wire is good. Uh, the company's broken, yeah. but you're not. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I saw they lost a bunch of money. Yeah, like, their investors are uh, not too happy today. right now. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Ugh. Um, we'll let's start with yeah. Carnival. So or, I'm, our job or house. I don't well, care let's, where you want to start. Let's start with the yeah. job. Let's start with the job. Yeah, that is important. So, related, um, so. yeah. Uh, so in February, I was a um, editor, uh, the nighttime editor at Jalopnik, doing a bunch of work for um, Popular Science, and I still, I still to this day run flatsixes.com, a Porsche website. Um, in May, I got a new job. I'm now the director of the Crawford Auto Aviation Museum, um, so I get to play with cars, like full scale cars. And a lot of them uh, every day. It's pretty great. We have a 190 like, like car collection. A, I feel like that was a dig. Full scale cars as opposed to us who play with toy cars all day. No, it wasn't <laughs> a dig. I've <laughs> I've been able to play with toy with toys and with yeah. uh, scale models for my entire life. Now I have a collection of 190 cars that I get to uh, that's, mess with. That's pretty amazing. Which is, Pretty cool. And you and I have both um, been to the Crawford Museum because you guys hosted, yes. before you were there officially, you hosted a Radwood yes. display. And Andrew and I went out there to uh, yep. visit uh, the ghost of Camden Tubbed Cam and <laughs> visit the museum as well and see the display that was there. Yes. So we did get to see a good number of the collection. I'm sure there's a lot of cars that were not on display also at the same time, but it was yes. definitely a very, so the... very neat space. Yeah. It was, it's very cool. Um, the, uh, the whole building has kind of been redone since then. So a lot of things have moved around the lower, the whole lower floor was gutted, uh, and refloored and, and painted and everything. So it's all new lighting. Yeah. It definitely, it definitely had a, uh, your best friend's basement, your best friend's parents, childhood basement feel before. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and it was all asbestos tile and everything, so that all had to be abated and whatever. So um, I basically came in in the middle of renovations, and there was a motorcycle exhibit going on, which is totally in my wheelhouse, uh, no pun intended. And so, like, I've I kind of came in and everything was running full steam through the summer. We took a car to Pebble Beach. We won an award. Um, I t- I think I had I went like 13 or 14 weekends in a row where I was taking a car from the collection to a car show and, you know, presenting it and and being a representative for the museum and everything. So like 
this is really the first time that I've been able to sit down and take a breather since I started in May. Um, and we have a, a new exhibit opening on November 17th, which is uh, 11 days from now as we record this. So I've had to organize, this is my first exhibit that's actually like I'm in charge of it. Um, so we have a 15 car Porsche exhibit coming in. So uh, on Brad, Brad, if you want to plug your ears and go, uh, I don't know what a 964 or 993 is. That's, you know. Oh, that's come fine. on now. I'm good. I've, I said before, <laughs> I'm good up to 993. It's after 993 where okay. we start to lose it. Okay. Well, um, so the, the, the premise of this exhibit is in 1982, uh, Porsche was going to kill off the 911. They were the sales were kind of in the tank they were they had the 928 uh as the new flagship for the brand and 911 was kind of just floating along until it died um so the a new president was a new ceo was hired he saw uh, sales projections and the line for the 911 ended in 1982 so he took a magic marker and continued the line off the edge of the sheet, across the wall, out the door, and down the hallway, <laughs> on like writing on the wall with a pen. So he comes back, hands the pen back to the product manager, and says, "Do we understand each other?" And he says, "Yes." So that was like the saving of the 911, and the whole premise of this exhibit is this is what the world would have missed if the 911 had died in 1982. So here's all the the history and why things went this way and how we went from you know, the almost dead um, SC in 1982 through 996 turbo makes 444 horsepower, all wheel drive, twin turbocharged, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So, so from 82 to 2005 is kind of where the, the exhibit runs. Um, how did we go from this simple sports car that barely survives to a world beating supercar so come check it out it runs all winter it'll be fun i will try to get there myself but definitely for anybody in the audience who's anywhere near cleveland ohio uh, it's definitely a good take not only for this exhibit but the rest of the museum all the cars in there are amazing uh, my we've got a ton of stuff we is the amx the oh yeah the uh concept amx it's a concept car yeah yeah which i think is a the DT a car. amx i think so uh amx ramble seat so if you just yeah. look that up yeah it's a very, uh, cool it's car. very interesting piece uh we just finished restoration of a uh, championship winning formula 5000 mclaren uh that's going to be going on display uh we've got a mercedes 300 sl we've got a ferrari 365 coach built by Pinot you also Farina. you also have one of my favorite car stories from childhood the uh Al- Al- allegheny allegheny oh the the allegheny Al- ludlum allegheny steel stainless steel stainless steel, stainless steel. Yeah, stainless steel excuse me not aluminum stainless yeah. steel yeah. fords yeah. those are very cool all, yes all the stainless cars are my favorite actually yep yeah i really like those a lot that's pretty cool it's a it's a really cool story. They uh they just wanted to prove that they could shape body panels and stainless, yeah. which is notoriously hard to work with. Um, so so I, I'd, have... I'd I'd go out on a limb and I'd call it uh, the Peterson of Cleveland. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'll take it. I mean, I don't I'll know if there's much competition, but it's the Peterson. There of Cleveland, isn't. So <laughs> yeah, it's, there it's... isn't. But that's awesome. As far as the East Coast, it's it's pretty good. It's pretty up there. The East Coast has some heavy hitting car museums, uh, and it's mm-hmm. no Simeon like is the probably Simeon. the heaviest. Yep, yeah. Simeon, the his... Newport. There's a couple of them, but it's yeah, the... yeah. The I went to the one in Newport. It's pretty. There's two in Newport. Uh, yeah. The Newport Car Museum is they. So the thing that I have learned the in the car museum there. business, yeah, Audrey. Well, yeah. There's Audrain and the Newport. Audrain is tiny. There's like twenty cars in it. Uh, it's a really cool location. It's really neat. It's really well curated. They had a Radwood display while I was there. Uh, they called it Young Timers, but, you know. Um, very cool. Uh, the uh, Newport Car Museum is further out of town, and it's much bigger, like square footage, and they have, I don't know, 110 cars or something like that. So the thing that I've learned in the museum industry, and I'm actually on 
uh, Tuesday, I'm flying to Naples, Florida for a uh, automobile museum uh, conference. So it's all very nerdy. But anyway, the That's thing that I've learned about the museum industry is most museums, well, some museums are like billionaires collections that they've turned into a tax shelter. Like the Simeon. And like the Simeon, like um, Revs Institute, like um, any, you know, there's one in Colorado, the Shelby Museum. Uh, that's just like a, a guy's collection of Shelby's and GT40s that he opened to the public for $5 or something like that. Um, then there are the kind of municipal, like they're, they're all, they're 501c3s, they're all run by um, donation. Like, I mean, to an extent, the Peterson, they're very well funded by several well-to-do car enthusiasts in the area uh, um, Lars Anderson, or like I think is that in boston yeah yeah or like um uh the audrain i mean they're supported by jay leno uh, among others but um and then you've got museums like ours that are kind of uh have been i mean our collection started in 1943 so we're one of the oldest car museums in the world let alone you know, just in the U S so cars, when our museum started, were like just used cars. Yeah. They're all 30 years old. Yeah. Right. They were all 92 luminous. uh, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Right. So, and, and not only that, they were 92 luminous that couldn't go on the highway. Like they had no usefulness. They were garbage. Um, so people were probably like, why would anybody keep a, you know, 1904 white steam car? Or, uh, you know, we have a, a 1909 Simplex that was guaranteed to do 100 miles an hour, but it was an open-top car, and, like, who would actually do that? <laughs> and there were no roads in 1909, you know, all of these things. So, like, um, uh, you know, ours is run on donation, and it's run on... Um, we had, when it started, Fred Crawford was a very wealthy guy. He ran... Uh, Thompson Products, which became TRW. And so he was the president, and the museum actually started as the Thompson Auto album, which was at the Thompson headquarters, and it was his like little private collection that he opened to the public. Um, he donated to the Historical Society the full collection when he retired in uh, 1963. And um, he gave, you know, a substantial amount of money to go toward the upkeep of the cars. But, you know, that was 60 years ago, almost. So um, the money that he gave then was worth a lot more then than it is now. And it's still a substantial amount, but it's like every year, especially with inflation and stuff, it's like, that's eh, getting a little bit less and it's getting a little bit harder to, to cover our bills and all that kind of stuff. So, um you know that we do have to rely on the, the local community and, and public donations and state funding and that kind of stuff so there's a lot of museums that are like they put their their budget considerations totally last and it doesn't matter and they run what you know they, they run huge exhibits and they they're allowed to do a lot of that stuff because they're funded by private funding and and billionaires that just go yeah whatever you know make it happen and then there are museums several museums that I, that I've been to that I know of that are, um, I wouldn't say struggling, but they're, they have to be much more cost conscious. So, uh, trying to put on big exhibits while keeping under a budget is like stress city, but it's a lot of fun. I get to do a lot of weird off the wall things that, um, yeah, I'm not going to lie. It it sounds almost like a dream job. It's totally, I mean, it, if I look at my career history, it all kind of leads up to this because I've got the marketing experience, I've got the the event running experience, I've got interpersonal, I've got writing, I've got, you know all of these things that all lead up to it. So it's totally, you know, when I got in on board, I was like, oh yeah, this is exactly what I'm here for. This is totally what I'm here for, and I love Summer doing Brad. it. It's great. 
That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's supposed to be the summer of Brown. So. Excellent. I'm, uh, I'm super excited for you. Uh, I, I can't wait to get back to the museum. Uh, I have not done a cross country drive since you've been in charge over there. So I haven't had a reason to yet, <laughs> but uh, on the next cross country drive, you can bet your butt I'm going to be there. So cool. I need to uh, yeah, check it out for sure. Uh, like I said, I encourage anybody. And you have a place to stay there. anytime. Excellent. So. You heard that all the audience? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, if, um, if i know you and you're cool you've got yeah. a place to stay <laughs> no i'm i'm thoroughly i'm thoroughly excited and interested in going to see it again so i hope i can see that porch exhibit because that sounds cool and yeah i i do have a what if the 911 ended in 82 think of how much more porsche could have done with their engineering maybe it would have been a good thing could they have <laughs> maybe could they have <laughs> Let's stick the fuel handling I, rear engine car and make it make it as good as we can. <laughs> I will I will contend that without the nine eleven Porsche would have died. It probably for sure. Have, yes, uh, I think that's the Cayenne. But sure, no. <laughs> well, no, it's without, not the Cayenne. Hold on, hold on, hold the on. The Boxster <laughs> saved the company. Without, Dang it! Without the nine eleven, we never would have had a Boxster to save the company. Yep. And without the Boxster, yep. we never had, would have had a Cayenne to save the company again. Hundred percent. Yeah. Well, no, they, Cayenne didn't save the company. It didn't. Cayenne, Cayenne allowed them grew the company. To, allowed them to build ridiculous stuff for super enthusiasts. I think. I disagree. Than otherwise. Uh, okay. I disagree. I, I will. I will refer to your opinion on this because you are the Porsche guy. You're the guy setting up the Porsche exhibit. So I, I'm yeah. looking from the outside, and it seems like once Cayenne came out, that's when Porsche was like, "Oh, we're also going to build this ridiculous stuff." Because we have all I mean, they built income. before the Cayenne existed, and when they were broke as hell, they built the 959, the 911 GT1, you know, all this crazy stuff. They've always built crazy stuff. Yeah, I guess and it just, always. There are just so many more rich people now that I see more of them now. I forget about it, I guess, maybe. Thousand percent. Yeah. Thousand <laughs> percent. All you yeah. have to do is go to. There's Porsche, way more Porsche, rich people. Porsches and coffee at four till four and see. There's 13 different one of one Porsches here. Like how? How is this a thing? It's a yeah. Porsches are a uh, an old money and a new money car. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I think Lamborghinis went... are all new money. Porsche gets both. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, but I will say, Cayenne definitely grew the company. It's I mean it's half the co- the company sales right now is Cayenne. Uh, not quite. But um, between Cayenne and Macan is like 65%, I think, of global sales. So, like, yeah, that, it's tons. Tons. They build way more SUVs than they do sports cars. Sure. 100%. And so does Lamborghini. So. But, <laughs> but prior to uh, when the Cayenne came out in 2003, Boxster was the best selling car Porsche had ever sold in history. Yes, it was. I mean, it was forty grand in nineteen ninety seven. They sold. They minted money on that car. Sure. And just the research that I've done in nineteen ninety three, a nine eleven took like one hundred and sixty hours man hours to build, and in nineteen ninety seven, a Boxster took thirty. So okay. so they were like way more profitable. They were yeah. cranking them out, and now a Cayenne takes like six. What's oh, that's so, insane? What's crazy to me yeah. about a forty thousand dollar car in ninety seven? A lot of cars cost forty grand in ninety seven that weren't as good as a Boxster. One hundred percent. Yeah, I mean the window mm-hmm. sticker on my old Saab nine thousand was thirty eight grand. You know, mm-hmm. a new Toyota Super Turbo was almost sixty by ninety seven. You yep. know, a three thousand GT three hundred ZX. They were all at the end of their run or towards the end of their run, and they were all fifty sixty grand. So you could buy that mm-hmm. Boxster for forty grand, and you know t- t- it had that reputation amongst the uppity jerks that it was the secretary car or whatever, or why not just buy a Miata? But obviously, it was a better car than any of those, and it was a yeah a heck of a bargain at forty thousand dollars. So I can see how that could definitely mm-hmm. be considered saving the company for sure. Um, the funny yeah. thing is, they sold so many of them that the bottom fell out, and they were like five grand for a while. But <laughs> nonetheless, totally, totally at forty thousand dollars. That was a heck of a car. 996 was the same problem because because yeah. it was so well done 
and because it was so cheap, um, they sold them. I mean, they just printed money on those things. They just moved them like units. And that was the same, The you know, for a long time, you get one for 10 grand, 12 grand. Yeah. I, I, I and they've think... started to go back up again, but they're, yeah. When I think of Porsches in general, I, I tend to think that the last, oh, maybe 15 years, but definitely the last 10 years have seen like a surge, a super surge in popularity with the cars. Um, obviously, mm-hmm. we all talk about the Porsche bubble and how you know a good air cooled nine eleven doesn't matter what it is is going to be seventy grand minimum. <laughs> there's nothing under mm-hmm. that, and that's for an automatic Targa. Like, there's nothing that costs less <laughs> right. than that. Like, there's it doesn't even matter anymore, and it just seems like it's all related to their marketing and their amount of cars in the road that were new. So once you had the Boxer, mm-hmm. I started it, and then the Cayman came out, and that helped it. But you also had the Cayenne and the Macan and there was just the, the the brand image in the past 15 years has grown immensely which is the reason that the Porsche hate is because of the popularity you know at, mm-hmm. at the end of the day I know I am not proud of it but I'm a bit of an automotive hipster and it mm-hmm. makes me upset sometimes when things that I'm like oh this is cool become like the new hot popular thing and I always love old 911s and boxers and I just don't want to pay the money for them anymore so I mean, there were years where I was like, I'm going to buy a 912 and I'm going to buy a 200 horsepower scat motor for Volkswagen and make a hot rod out of it, you know, because that the whole project would have cost 10 grand, you know, but nowadays that's not even a thought anymore because even a good 60s 912 is 60 grand. It doesn't make any sense. So it's that whole automotive history. I was looking looking at 912s because it was the last uh, long hood that was affordable. Yep. And I couldn't quite stretch to like twelve grand when they they jumped from like eight to twelve. Yep. And so I had saved eight, and I went to go buy one, and then they were all of a sudden they were twelve, sure. and I was like, oh, man, well I can't afford it. Well, I guess I'll buy a Boxster. So I bought a Boxster for seventy five hundred bucks. Yeah. But if then, I had stretched to that twelve grand, it would be a seventy thousand dollar car sure. now. <laughs> Unless you cut the roof off and left it in your garage at the Boxster. Yeah. But, sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I mean that Boxster is never going to be worth anything. The thing it's, about it's, that Boxster, it was it was really nice until somebody ripped the front end of it off with their dually. Right. So, like, and then the insurance company cut me a check for what I had paid for the whole car. So I was like, ah, free car. Yeah. I do whatever I want. <laughs> I do whatever I want with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, long-time listeners will remember that my, my biggest automotive regret story was not coming up with the extra two grand for a 75 911 in, like, 2008. Mm-hmm. You know, it was... I yeah. wanted to pay the guy eight. He wanted ten, you know, and it sure. was just, it was, it was just too much for a car that currently wasn't running. Would I have ever mm-hmm. done anything with it? Maybe not. Maybe it would have sat in my yard like my Galant VR four did for a decade. Yeah, but but appreciated it. Apparently. But it would have appreciated five <laughs> times what I paid for it. You know, I like the Galant, which I just sold. I think we talked about and I lost money on. But it is what it is. You know, so yeah, life, life yeah. goes on, and you never. I guess Still you never really you. can know what's going to happen. So. Anyway, nope. off of Porsche talk. What's next? What did you buy? Since yep. we last talked to you. Look at the uh, fun Porsche. stuff. <laughs> oh, for, uh, Porsche. Yeah. God damn it. Um, Speak, speaking of nine nine sixes, let's let's go in yeah. order. What was the first car you bought since last February when you were on? I think it was actually a Nissan. Uh, I think the Figaro. Yeah, the, we bought a Nissan Figaro, nineteen ninety Nissan Figaro. Um, it was a car that I had tried to get my wife to buy because she texted me one day and she was like, she was in the Starbucks line and there were two convertibles in front of her. And she's like, Oh my God, the weather's perfect. I should have a convertible. I was like, you should have a convertible. Let's fix that. Um, so I kept like sending her stuff that we should buy. And one of them was a Figaro and she's like, I like this, but it's the wrong color. And, uh, so we were just kind of like, thankfully they make more than one. Yeah, <laughs> actually you're wrong. The first, we just talked about this, how we forgot about it. The first car that we bought when after since the last time I was on the show was the Cadillac Alante because I tried to get her to buy a Figaro. She said it was the wrong color, and then I mentioned it on Twitter, and somebody said, "Oh, this guy's selling an Alante." On one of my mutual uh, friends on on Twitter, and I was like, "I've always wanted an Alante. Let's try this." So I sent him a message. He he gave me a cheap price. We flew into uh, South Carolina, picked it up, and drove it back. 
it broke a quarter of a mile from the driveway. Convenient place to break. And I've and I have not driven it since. <laughs> and that was five months ago. Um, I th- the thing that I think is wrong with it is that a baffle collapsed in the exhaust, and there and it's just like, you know, too too muffled, over muffled, sure. and no no air will go through. So uh, it runs like crap, and I need a, a new muffler for it. But I thought it was a collapsed Ohio. cat. Is a good ride. Yeah. So. Yes. Yes. Uh, I thought it was a collapsed cat. It was not. So I replaced the cat and that didn't fix it. So uh, now I need to get into the muffler and fix that. But I've got other projects and other, you know, things on my mind. Sure. So we go to Radwood in Cleveland. And uh, there's a Figaro with a for sale sign on it on the corner. My wife sees it and goes... I love this thing. I was like, well, you should test drive it and let me know. So she test drove it, loved it. We bought it. So we, we have that. Um, then I bought a Harley Livewire, which we mentioned earlier. I've always wanted one. Best bike I've ever ridden. So I bought that. Uh, and then most recently, a, fr- a, a friend of ours or a friend of mine... Gave me a really, really good deal on a 996 Turbo that I could not turn down. So I flew out to San Francisco, uh, picked it up, and drove it back home with mm, middling to fair results. (laughs) Well, the first day, I got a nail in my tire, which was, like, just bad luck. Uh, So I had, of course, I was in Central California. There was, it was a Saturday night at, like, 9.30. 9.30. And of course, Sunday, no tire places are open. So I was like, oh god, I'm going to be stranded. Uh, I found a guy who was selling a set of wheels on Facebook Marketplace with good tires on them. Well, bad tires, but tires. And uh, so I bought those, put them on, finished the drive to my old house in Reno, where I had another set of Porsche wheels waiting. So I put those on, and hit the road and I brought a spare set of rear wheels with me in the back seat. I was like, just in case I have anything go wrong, I'll have the spare for the front axle and I'll have two rear tires for the rear. So I made it to drove all day, did great, made it to, um, middle of like just into Wyoming over the border from Utah and had a left rear blowout at 90 miles an hour around a corner. (laughs) Like there was a curve on the highway, left rear blows out, the whole car steps sideways, like freaked me out. Pull off, turns out the, um, the inside lip of the tire had just like worn through to shreds. So like, I was like, oh God, there's a ton of camber, and caster or uh, and toe on the rear. Um, it's weird that it happened this time, but like the guy I bought it from did like six track days with the car and never changed the tires. So if I swap a set of, another set of tires on, it'll probably make it the rest of the way home. Everything will be fine. Put those tires on, went a hundred miles, and they were worn down to nothing. So really, really aggressive track alignment. Very, very aggressive. It was, turns out it was four degrees negative camper. Whoa. And half a degree toe in in the rear. So just a ton, it was just scrubbing the inner sidewall of the tire. Just gone. Yeah. Was that thing even roll if you put the clutch in or just like stop? Uh, That seems like it's a very aggressive alignment. So that's the thing is like, it never did anything weird when I was driving. Like, it, it always felt pretty planted, not too bad. And I was getting 28 miles of the gallon in a 575 horsepower car. I yeah, it's I was weird. like, oh, this seems normal. Like, But I guess it was just like barely riding on the edge of the tire 
and that was why I was getting good mileage. So I, I guess the first question everybody had was, did you check the tires before you left? But you probably did. They just weren't. Working. I did, yeah. And they, it was you know typical track wear. It was like you know, sure they weren't, they weren't down to wear. Because bars. the first thing everybody said, the first thing everybody said that you know mutually knows us. Uh, I won't throw too many names out there until after the show. Um, was basically like. How did he leave California to drive all the way across country and not look at the tires before he left? But I was like, I feel like he probably did. Yeah. But also, it is Brad, and sometimes he just <laughs> throws caution to the wind and does things. So maybe he didn't, which I think was the same topic of conversation that had happened in that same conversation. So yeah, who knows? I mean, but you did you did look? I did look. I looked at it. I looked at a lot of things. I mean, we didn't put it up on a lift or anything, but I did get down and look, and and I felt the tires, and I you know obviously the the inner was worn a little more than the outer, but it it wasn't down to wear bars. And I was like, oh, it's dry and clear. It'll be fine. You know, and I, I put, I probably, I mean, it was probably a thousand miles ish on that set of tires before they blew. Um, and I mean, I should have probably checked, you know, 500 miles in, or whatever, and I didn't, and it, you know, it's just whatever. It is what it is. In in your defense, in your defense, I bought the Porsche from I know. you, <laughs> and I didn't even check the I didn't check the air I pressure, know. and then when I did put air in the tires, I didn't check. I never checked them again either until I got sure, home either. So, sure. you know, if everything seems fine, I guess it is fine, yeah. right? Because I I did the same yeah. thing. So, so anyway, um, I kind of limped it to the middle of Wyoming. Uh, with a variety of different tire methods that are not recommended. Um, at one point I had one of the fronts on the rear and the spare on the front. So my right side of the car was like a four inch wide wheel on the front and a nine inch wide wheel on the rear. And on the other side, it was a 11 inch and a nine inch. So it's like, pulling and driving like crazy and i so i i just kind of limped it along the highway at 55 and every time a truck came up behind me i would ditch for the uh exit ramp or for uh the cur- you know pull off to the shoulder or whatever so it was uh frightening but um middle of the day in wyoming there's not that much traffic so it wasn't too bad and then a friend from colorado came and picked me up with his flatbed and hauled me to a town in Colorado that had a Porsche uh, service shop. And uh, so I got a set of tires sent to them, had an alignment done, got it back uh, literally like after they closed um, at like 5.30 that that night. And then I drove from uh, basically Denver to Cleveland without stopping. I was in the driver's seat from Denver to Cleveland, and I felt like death when I got here. <laughs> but the car's here, runs great. Uh, it's the fastest thing I've ever owned. It was, it's worth 20 grand more than I paid for it, and it's great. Cool thing about the Porsche popularity now is that you were able to find a Porsche specialist in the middle of nowhere to fix your car to get you the rest of the way home. So there is some advantage there. Yes. There's no... Um, well, it was a suburb of Denver. It wasn't still, you were in nowhere, the middle of nowhere but, and were able yes. to find somebody with a flatbed who was willing and close enough to make it work. So yes. that's that's the, the... Yes. This is one of the benefits of, of building a large sure. network of automotive enthusiasts. Yeah, it's is, kind of the, uh, the, me- the meme you see all the time on the internet. Like, hey, mom, I made a new friend. Real or internet? Oh, internet. <laughs> yes. But yes. in this case, yes. your internet friends can become real friends because you totally. meet them in these situations, which is how, you know, other than Andrew and I, most of the people who we've had as guests in this podcast, we know because the internet. So yes. we wouldn't know you if it wasn't for your podcast and then eventually the internet and eventually Redwood. So it yep. all ties together. So I, if I can plug, I would say um, Kyle from Out of Spec Studios, uh, good dude. He makes good videos. Go check sure. them out. Um, they yeah, do all you're kinds of definitely cool okay stuff, to, so. to plug somebody like that. Uh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. He helped me out and uh, gave me a place to stay, which yeah. was really nice. 
lent me a car to use while my car oh. was in the shop. Yeah. Dude was great. Had, had a great time. So I dig it. Uh, yeah, so the car's here. Um, I'm doing the typical dumb stuff that I always do to cars. Um, you know, hopefully not uh, ruining this one beyond uh, the point that it's... Well, no the good news is anything. the car's not perfect, um, so you can improve it. So. Yes. It does need a little bit of work. It's cosmetically not great, but mechanically it's pretty good. It does have... Uh, a recurring check engine light for an uh, evap probably, leak. Probably needs a walnut need blast. Find. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> yeah. I really hope not. <laughs> uh, but it does smell like gasoline uh, when you get to like the bottom half of the tank, which is yeah. Weird. Usually it's when they're full, but that's okay. Um, that's strange. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a gas cap. Replace the so gas is, cap. So that is it like? It. So it was I mean, an all drive car, out, but now but... it's a rear drive. Is that what I understand? That's pretty common. Yes. Yes. So it's fairly common, especially for track cars. Um, they did it the wrong way. Uh, there's the, there's the way that people do it, which is just remove the drive shaft that connects okay. the transaxle to the front, uh, diff. Um, but that keeps 150 pounds on the nose and uh, whatever. So the main reason you need to do that is for the traction control system to be able to read the ABS rings yeah. that are part of the uh, axle shafts. So the right way to do it is I ordered, um, basically there are like hubs that are the yeah. inner part of the axle that has the ABS ring on it without an axle attached to it. Um, so then you can remove the diff, you can remove the axle shafts, you can actually do it the right way, and the computer still doesn't freak out about it, which is nice. Um, and so yeah, it's uh, it's got big turbos, big intercoolers, uh, big fuel pump, injectors, a crazy tune, and uh, does allegedly... Um, dyno proven 575 horsepower on pump gas at 1.6 mm -hmm. bar which is stout 24 say 25 yeah. psi yeah. so it's that's um, a lot of pressure so originally yeah. on yeah. So that's, that's on lot. california 91 that's so that's pretty good so so maybe maybe a little yes. more in ohio yeah. and so ohio 93 it'll be and uh yeah, right. And at, yeah, I'm at sea level, so I mean, would have been at sea level before, but it's cool. Um, yeah, it's it's quick. It's fun. Uh, our friend Rick drove it yesterday, and he was like, yeah, it's pretty much as fast yeah, as my McLaren. It's a McLaren, like, so that's a good, cool. uh, a good measuring stick. <laughs> Might not be as flashy as a McLaren, yeah. but it's definitely, uh, definitely as fast as one. No. So very cool. So it's got a couple of dents and dings and it has a, you know, the front bumper needs a uh, repaint and um, the interior is typical 996 trash. But uh, yeah, I dig it. It's a There's something fun. to be said about a fun and ratty car. So. That's kind of the majority of everything mm -hmm. I've ever bought. So, and then it gives mm -hmm. you those, mm -hmm. those small goals that are, E more easily achieved in minor cosmetic improvements versus major overhauling on vehicles. So I uh, yeah I, yeah I mean the the big thing right now is it's got the wrong offset wheels because the wheels that I put on it are GT three wheels which are narrow body so it sits in about you know two inches on either side. Um, so I've got wheels. I ordered a bunch of parts from my friends at ECS Tuning. I uh, still haven't given the car a bath. I uh, put a Momo wheel in it. I need to figure out how to get the uh, airbag light to go away. And I'll do a few little things. I want to do kind of like an OEM plus. We, kind of we need to have a, an so, intervention where we teach um, you how fun it can be to clean and maintain paint. We'll get there someday. We'll get Ooh, there someday. Eh. Doubt it. We'll, we'll get doubt there someday. <laughs> or we won't, and we'll just let you keep so, ruining it. Yeah. And we can buy it cheap from you later because it's ruined. 
<laughs> That's right. That's what you should do. No, no. We do. need to give you the full, the full enjoy how how enjoyable it can be to clean a car because when you're done, you're like, oh, that was impactful and enjoyable. I mean, the thing is, once you get it to a certain point, it just stays there for the most part. Yeah, so. and, and there's stuff that needs. I mean. It the hood doesn't match. It's a black hood on a silver car. I'm gonna have the whole thing once I get the bumper figured out. It's kind of cool. Yeah, I don't hate it. But uh, once I get the whole once the once I get the bumper figured out, I'm gonna wrap the whole thing uh, some weird Porsche color, and I'll do I don't know little touches here and there that make it pretty nice. You should you should match it to the 912. I thought about that, but if I'm going to match it to the 912, then I need to match all of my other cars, because that's how my brain works. No. No, just the Porsches. And then you, then your Guy Fieri, with all your yellow cars. Um, what's a used bumper cost? Like, what if you just bought a bumper of a random color and put it in the front? It'd look kind of cool. Uh, they're like 300 bucks. Not too bad. Um... I guess it depends on the random color because most of them were silver, so it would be a different silver because that that's a fairly rare. Yeah. All right. Well, that would yeah, look weird. Yeah. And then I would be like Magnus Walker or something, and I don't know if I want to. Be no, that. you're not. Listen, he can't. He doesn't own all of Ratty cars. Like it's not. It's not his thing. <laughs> no, he does the different color bumper thing. Yeah, I don't whatever. know. It's just like a. Whatever. We had a friend here that had a silver Miata and had a yellow front bumper on it. Or a green bumper? I don't remember. But it looked cool, so you could do something like that and be fine. The bumper itself isn't bad. It's just all... It got hit, so there's one, like, hole. Um, and then all the paint flaked off. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to strip it down to just bare plastic. And then I'm going to fill the hole and sand it down. And then wrap just the bare plastic. Because then... So do just the front bumper... In the same yellow as the 912. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna do I think oh, I'm gonna yeah. do the whole this car the in Porsche Moonstone, which is okay. like a pale purple color. Okay. There should be more purple cars. I listen, there definitely should be more purple cars. I'm stoked that the new BMW M two forty comes in a special purple color. Yeah, I've seen one. It's awesome. Oh, it's so good. It's like awesome. Yeah. I saw I saw it this weekend. It was amazing. Yeah, I was like, good. is that factory? Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> and the new RS6 wagon comes in purple. And there should definitely be more purple cars. No question. I was actually thinking the other day. Yes. There's a 993. There's a 993 on Bring a Trailer right now that is uh, purple interior, purple top, purple uh, paint. And it's rad. Aside from the fact that it's a Tiptronic, it's rad. I think is that the same car that was on on. I think it's the same car that was on my site. On, oh really? On oh, yeah. could be. Like a year ago. Oh well, if it was a year ago, it's probably like double the money then, because they, they've no. I, I actually I think you did an article for us on it on Flat Sixes. I could have. It was a triple purple nine nine three or the nine six four. I don't remember now. Ugh. Porsche codes. I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. Conversation anyway. over. Yeah, we don't have to talk All about right. Porsches anymore. Um, yeah. I love the Figaro. It's great. I recommend anybody who doesn't need to drive on the highway get a Figaro immediately because they're amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, none of my cars are highway cars, so I get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do like 90s Nissans here, so. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Trade um, for a Q45? No. <laughs> Q45 is pretty we, sweet. I drove it the other day. It looks good. I think it belongs in uh, Akron, Ohio. Um, sure. I'm sure he's listening and he knows I'm talking about him. <laughs> but anyway. It's got a little uh, bit of rust anyway, so it's not perfect. You can, you can drive it in the wintertime. Yeah. <laughs> he needs a good winter. Oh, no. He just got a uh, cross cabriolet for the winter. But anyway, nothing like buying a convertible uh, for Ohio winters. <laughs> hey, you know what? Uh, yeah. Uh, so speaking of, um, we've started. If you're in the Akron area, if you're in the Cleveland area, 
we've started doing a Friday morning show called uh, Valley Vibes. And I think we're going to run it through the winter. It's just like a casual, low-key meetup. And it's been a lot of fun. We've had some really cool stuff out there. Um, there's a new NSX that showed up at, on Friday. Uh, all the way down to, you know, the the normal enthusiast cars like a um, Nissan C4 or Corvette or a, a Chrysler. Uh, shoot, what was that? What was the uh, the RT sedan in the nineties? Dodge Spirit. Did? Spirit, yes. It was not an RT, but it, there was a Spirit. That was cool. Uh, it was a V six car. Really neat. Yeah, really no, well it looks done. it looks like a it looks like a cool time. It looks very similar to uh, the auto off topic um, for noon cup. So it's a very similar concept. This seems to be an idea that's yeah. kind of kicking off all over the country. These smaller gatherings of mm-hmm. like minded enthusiasts, just kind of getting rid of the whole big group vibe and keeping it, totally. keeping it casual and keeping it with just people who get it for lack of a yeah, word. I... Well, here, here's, here's the, I went to a cars and coffee this morning. <laughs> of course it was 80 degrees in November here today. So everybody was there because it was the last one of the season. Um, it's the one in Andover and they have a small parking lot and there was a lot of really, really cool stuff, but also a lot of junk. Right. And they didn't have enough parking. But for it's everybody. fine because first come, first serve. That's how it works. But if you don't like, get in, you don't mm-hmm. get in. Have a nice day. Mm-hmm. See you next time. Yeah. It is. It is. But I was thinking about this because uh, I was like, I don't know about Brad's idea of doing it weekly. But then I was like, no, that does kind of make sense because it doesn't make it, no offense, it doesn't make it as special. So you don't have an overcrowd yeah. once sure. a month and of people trying to get into really, it. Really, it's, I mean, we, more, we only buy a dozen donuts spread- and a. Yeah. carafe of coffee it's not like we're buying yeah you know we're losing our shirt on, on donuts you know every week so it's it, you know it might grow and i'm sure next summer it'll be bigger than 12 to 15 cars on we might get 30 cars or something i don't know but especially now when it's 40 50 degrees yeah. out and people are hanging out in their uh winter coats with the lights on because the Last week it was before the time change and didn't get light till 8 30. Um, but you know, it's, it's totally like, you've got to be dedicated to it because you've got to show up at, you know, crack of dawn and it's in the Valley. It's 30 miles from really anything. Uh, there is cell reception, so it's not like it's the middle of nowhere, but, um, it's kind of hard to get to and that kind of weeds out anybody who's not really into it. You know, if you're just going to show up to stunt, like this isn't the place to do it. Sure. It's come, yeah, you it's know, kind we, of, we don't really care what you drive. Cars. It's, it's totally yeah. just a, you know, come have a good, all, all we care that you bring is a good attitude. That's it. Yep. And that's that's the most important thing. That's what we discussed off air all the time about our you know forenoon cup. And that's why it's sort of invite only at the moment, just because we don't want riff raff. Well, I like mm-hmm. I like the early morning, like early, because it gets it done early mm-hmm. and it keeps. That's the problem. This one in Andover started yeah. at nine. People were rolling into the parking lot at eight and like filled it up. So now it's become. These are starting to become oh, okay. just cruise nights in the morning where there's just people, right. there's just people sitting there in their chairs in front of their car and they'll just sit there the entire time. It's, I feel like it's yeah. supposed to be more of a casual. You come in, have your coffee. I think the hard walk rule, around, talk to your, some of your friends, see some cars. Yeah. The hard rule should out, be, and then, and then some other people, if you don't in, have a handicap just, blackguard, you can't like, bring a chair. Like that's the way four till four is. <laughs> that's the rule. I don't, I don't want to exclude people who have to sit down for medical reasons. But if you don't have a handicap placard, you can't bring a chair. Well, your car so. has chairs in it. Yeah, it's even weirder to sit in your car. Uh, it's fine. Yeah, I, I think if you have a medical reason you need to sit down, you're welcome to bring a chair. But listen, I'm trying to be, uh, you know, people with yeah, disabilities yeah. act here. I don't want them on my back. Sure. So we got the, that's our rule. Sure. L- listen, people, people want to enjoy no, things. No, all different ways, I'm and that's fine. That Enjoy it the way you want to enjoy it. 
I I just want to do it. Yeah, I I want to do it a little differently. Like I'm very casual about it. Like I went for a little bit. I had my kid with me. We walked around. I had he picked. He keeps picking the Montero to go because that's what he likes. He didn't want to pick it. I was like, "What car do you want to pick?" Because they were all sitting outside to the, yesterday, and he of course picked Data Truck. You just need like, to right, give fine. him a good pull in the. We'll take that because so like, you want to oh, take all right, it. Now I get it. Um, yeah, that's what needs to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking. I was like, maybe I should just put him in it and take him for a ride. But whatever. I'm glad I brought the truck because it was so packed. I just parked it on the street, and I don't care about right. it. Right. Like. It's like you can't the rock really slide will destroy your door. So the rock sliders <laughs> stick out from the. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. Sure. Um, but anyway, I mean, enjoy the stuff that you wait. Yeah, I, I think it. I think that moving it's, it's to each their own, but it's kind of like moving moving. Some to of these Arizona are getting a little crazy. Seeing the difference in car culture <laughs> on the West Coast versus the East Coast. I know I'm getting crap. Arizona's not the coast, whatever. It's close enough. Um, seeing a difference in car culture here versus there. And seeing these early morning gatherings that people show up at five, six in the morning, and then you're done by nine. It yeah. really kind of opened my eyes to like, this is how we should enjoy this stuff. Like, get up, enjoy yeah. it. You know, if you want to take your car for a drive afterwards, great. If you want to just go home and do stuff with your family because you have kids and whatever, great. Go do that. Like, yeah. you know, I don't have any kids that live with me. My my kid is now an adult and Naomi's kids are adults. So we're, you know. <laughs> all by ourselves yeah. and do whatever we want, but we also have other things you want to do too. So it's like, we can just Let's... go ahead and enjoy the day afterwards. Like you want to do car stuff all day. Great. You don't want to, there's something you can do that starts at six, seven, eight in the morning, the latest, and you're mm. done by lunchtime. So yeah, we do, we do seven to 10 and we have a couple of different groups of people come in because the early risers or the people who arrive at seven or seven fifteen or whatever are usually people who have to work at nine. So like it's sure. still there's still time for you to go in the morning before work. You get your coffee, you get your donut, whatever, and yeah. then you head into work. And then there are the people who are like, um, you know, like me or like Myron or like, you know, either retired or they're creatives and they don't really work on a schedule or they're, you know, they work during the night or they work from home or whatever. Um, they can stay a the little prostitutes later. Prostitutes and drug dealers come in later. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> lots of lots of those in the valley in Ohio. Yeah. Um, although, yeah, the fentanyl. Yeah, I was, was going to say I've, I've been to Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seen some, seen uh, some questionable people. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but this is a national park. We're in a national park, which is really cool. Sure. That's part of the part of the appeal. We're probably the only car show certainly the only car show in Ohio in a national park um, car show, car meet, car gathering, whatever you want to call it. So casual uh, gathering of friends who all like cars. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so when we're not dealing with the, the local cops um, trying to break up our rallies, uh, right. we enjoy our uh, cars and coffee kind of thing in a little parking lot in the, National Park, and it's nice. It's a good way to spend a Friday morning. I, I wish I was closer. I'd be there if I didn't have to yeah. work at 8 o'clock, which seems yeah. like always the way for me. So, <laughs> sure. Friday is also a good way to keep Riff Raff out because <laughs> totally. you know, it's, yeah. it's another, it's, like, you've got to be dedicated to it. You've got to be yeah. like, I want to be there. You can't just be casual, yeah. like, show up and be a dickhead. You know, I'm glad it's not more local to me because I'd be missing a lot of Fridays at work. <laughs> it would not be good for my employment. So <coughs> I got anyway. COVID. I got to work from home. Yeah. yeah. At least till noon. Every Friday. At least till noon. Yeah. 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 Every Friday. It's. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's a new COVID co- Friday, it's a new COVID Friday COVID variant Friday. of the COVID. Anyway. Excellent. Yeah. That's a good event if you're in the area. I've seen some pictures from it and it'll say a good time. So. It is, it is. Um, what else is new? Uh, yeah. But I've, I've been doing a lot of stuff. Uh, Pebble Beach was awesome. Took a car to Pebble Beach, came home with a trophy. That felt weird Excellent. and fun. We're, we're going to we're gonna need to hook you up with my dad so you can get a car to the uh, concourse north of Boston, too. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, the, yeah. Miss the sure. Misslewood Concord Elegance. I'm sure they'd love to have something from your collection with whatever you'd want to bring out for sure. 
So that, yeah. that was they just had their tenth anniversary last year, Andrew. I think. Oh, cool. Um, oh, yeah, nice. they do tour. They do yeah. tours. They have a beach, and they but do a the, tour. The location actually, if you didn't know where it was, some of the pictures in the ocean yep. you could think were Maple Beach actually. So nice. It's uh, it's, it's it's a good event. I'll send you some info, and maybe you guys can yeah. take a car out there because Boston isn't that far of a ride from Ohio. So it's less yeah. logistics than Pebble Beach, that's for sure. Oh, hundred so, percent. Yeah. Yeah, if it's I something I can that... haul myself, yeah, uh, yep. then totally, I could totally do that. Yeah, yeah. They have, I know they have a good relationship with. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Owl's Head Museum in Maine. I am. Yeah, I've never yeah, been, they, but they, I've they heard bring, very good things. They bring car down every year, and some other places cool. do too. So they definitely, it's definitely a, a neat event. So they'd love to have more representation and. You know, they're trying to be one of their, they're definitely the premier concourse north of Greenwich. So <laughs> it's hopefully they can become even more and more from here, you know, but it's, it's definitely yeah. a good event. So, and I, uh, I didn't make it this year, but I do try to get out there. So it'd be cool to get you bring a car there and we can hang out out there. So, yeah, I do want to call back to my SEMA trip real fast. I forget one important detail. Um, I got to go to the Shelby yeah. American factory and their factory. That museum. looked cool. I had another friend at that, at that event. Yeah. We got an invite to that. It's like a SEMA after party on, I think it was Tuesday or Thursday night or Wednesday night. And it was, it was really neat because, you know, all the Shelby history is in this one building and it's just, uh, it's just awe inspiring to see some of history and the factory where they build all of the Mustangs now is in the back. And it was all open to kind of turn around and to walk around and check out. So it was a very, very cool event. Brad. All right, cool. I don't know what happened to Brad. <laughs> it got booted again, apparently. So uh, I guess we'll wrap the, this up. The dogs ate the Wi-Fi. <laughs> they, I guess they did. So Bradley, where can uh, people find you? Uh, I am on the internet uh, everywhere. Um, <laughs> plug in hi, Brad, on Instagram at BC Brownell on Twitter for as long as that lasts. <laughs> um, and uh, follow, please follow the uh, museum. We've got uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all the things, uh, the Crawford Auto Aviation Museum. Just search for it. You'll find it. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, also, Autopia is coming up. Uh, all right. I'm, I don't know if any of you guys are electric car fans, but Autopia, December 4th at the Peterson Museum in the parking deck. So bring nice. anything powered by electrons. It'll be fun. Cool. So I don't know if Brad is, uh, I think Brad's trying to get back on, but I'll, he is uh, TSI SS 350 on Instagram. TSIS Thrifty. TSIS Thrifty. <laughs> there he is. So, also, our podcast, Odd Off Topic Podcast, on Facebook for as long as that lasts, I guess. Odd um, <laughs> Off Topic on Instagram. We're definitely more active there. Brad's had some SEMA pictures. We've got Scale Autocast on there. We're a little bit behind on posting some Scale Auto stuff, but I know we've gotten a bunch of new models in. Uh, there's that. You can follow me, Race and Anger on Instagram, Race and Anger on Twitter, um, and a couple other places like that for now and um yeah i think that's it right we got everything so that's it all We're right off. cool oh yeah i did yes, yes you did. missed that uh oh of course discord come join us on discord if you're listening to this you are invited just message us and we'll send you the link the discord is uh growing we've got maybe 20 people in there and uh it's mostly me complaining about my Volkswagen, but <laughs> <laughs> I can say I am a happy customer. No, it's not. There's a lot. There's a lot of content. There's a lot of there. content on there. Uh, I, love, I, I love the Discord. I'm a big fan of the Discord. I recently added a uh, motorcycle channel for yes. everybody that rides. There's a lot of good Two content on there for sure. Um, and I'll just I just keep posting. Uh, I think you should leave screen grabs about <laughs> motorcycles. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah as always keep cars analog and aim for the roses